Welcome inside with the insiders. Tom Pellicero, Ian Rappaport, Mike Garofolo. This is, of course, a football show on the NFL channel, but here we've got Ian wearing a Mets jersey. Mike's in a Philly shirt, and I'm wearing all black because the Twins have been dead since August. It's playoff baseball time. Dude, regular season. What happened time. to your Twins? <laughs> They just fell apart. It, uh, they were like right in it. And then just, I looked up and they were gone. <laughs> the funny thing is that happened during like the three weeks of Inside Training Camp Live where we're ping-ponging all over the country and I have, I'm have i not paying attention. All of a sudden I'm like, Wait, what happened? Were they winning the division like the whole summer? And then all of a sudden they're, they're seven games back here. We always get asked, so, I mean, at least I do all the time, like, well, who's your team? You, you cover football, like, who's your team? And, of course, the answer is, we can't cheer for anyone. But, Mike, like, the Phillies are on right now. Like, do you have actual fandom happening inside you at this moment? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm watching it right now. If you see me looking down, that's what I'm watching the whole time as we're taping the show. The Phillies are uh, tied nothing nothing to the top of the seventh. They just worked their way out of a jam. Good job, uh, Zach Wheeler. Um, so, yeah. I, but th the hard part is you get so invested. See, this is why it's easier for me. I'm a, I'm a hockey guy. I'm a big Flyers guy. Because we get so invested and we watch everything the, the whole summer. But the most important part of the season comes when we're incredibly busy. I, I, I'm, I, we're on the air right now. Uh, I'm watching it here. I was just chasing injury stuff and doing a whole bunch of other stuff and kind of had like one eye on the TV. That's the hardest part of baseball is th the best part. And sometimes when they have Sunday night games, that's even worse. Because then we're, all, we're really tied up. Go ahead. You know, the people always ask me about my Mets fandom. And I'm, you know, pretty out front with that being the only team I root for. But, Tom, like what you're talking about, I have one goal for the Mets, and it's the same every year. Just be relevant and important by, like, July 26th. Because all I ever – you know how many meals we eat alone on a training camp, right? Like, most of them in, like, airports or, like, weird bars in towns that we never go to where, like, everyone we would meet with is, like, in meetings and at training camp – all I want to do is watch the Mets on my iPad by myself at dinner. And if they suck by, like, August 2nd, it's depressing. This year was better. Last year was better until whatever. Anyway, that's all I root for. This year, though, I have some high hopes for the playoffs. One thing we know for certain is that the Mets and the Phillies will combine to score the same number of touchdowns that the Broncos and Colts combined to score last night, which is zero. I, I want to talk about that game specifically, what's going on in both Denver and Indianapolis. But first, this was prescient from Bucks quarterback Tom Brady. Here's what he said prior to that game happening on Thursday night football when he was asked about the idea that the early season results here show that there is parity right now in the NFL. I think there's a lot of bad football from what I watch. You know, <laughs> I watch a lot of bad football, a lot of yeah, poor quality of football. That's what I see. You can hear people chuckling at that response from Brady, but he is deadly serious if you look at his face as he's saying that here. I had our, our wonderful NFL research people pull some of these numbers here just on the early portion of the season. 43.9 points per game. That's obviously between both teams scored this season. That's the fewest through four weeks in five years. 4.6 offensive touchdowns, fewest in five years. The passing yardage, fewest in five years. 2.9 turnovers per game this season is the highest in six years. So offensively, guys, there is actual evidence here, not just anecdotal, but really the scoring numbers are down. The turnover numbers are up. Mike, I'll start with you. When you talk to people within the league, what, if anything, is actually going on right now in the NFL? Listen, if you talk to the coaches, you know exactly what they're going to say. The limited time on the practice field, the limited contact on the practice field, particularly with the offensive line coaches and even the defensive line coaches as well. Now, the union, if they're listening, J.C. Treader, the president of the union, would be one of those that would strongly oppose that and say there's plenty of work that needs to be done. There's plenty of technique, and it's healthier for us to do it this way. It's better on the player's body to not have that kind of contact. So we're going to have that argument for – Ever, probably, uh, between those two sides. I, I kind of side a, bit, a little bit on the side of the coaches. Now, I, I, I frankly would prefer players to have longer careers, players to be healthier after their playing career, uh, and suffer through some uh, 
poor football, as Tom Brady called it, rather than uh, have these players have two-a-days in full pads in the middle of August. Um, I, I think what the NFL and the NFLPA have done in recent years is really smart. Uh, I still prefer watching uh, what we've seen from a football standpoint than watching any other sport, which is why it's hard for us to give up our fandom, but whatever, that's fine. It's a whole different thing. Uh, I, I just, I, I really do agree that sometimes the technique suffers but what the good news is, I think once you get later in the year, we see better football. Now, these teams now that are so tightly packed together, what's going to happen, and it's already started to happen, is teams will lose guys. It happens every year. Guys get injured. You lose guys for the season or an extended period of time. The deeper teams are going to survive. The teams that don't have that depth are going to suffer. And now all of a sudden, you got the Buccaneers and Falcons going together uh, at 2-2 at two and two playing for first place. I don't know when they play again. Maybe if it's in week 15 or something like that, the Falcons will be well in the rearview mirror. So I think that's what you're starting to see right now as far as why teams are tightly packed. But the injuries will be the great equalizer and we'll sort this thing out eventually. And you'll, you'll know which teams are better and which teams are uh, probably going to suffer through November and December quite soon. Yeah. It is hard to know who's good and who isn't good. Like, I'm thinking about, you know, we have a month till the trade deadline, a little less, and I'm thinking about, like, who's going to be available, who's going to be selling, who's going to be buying. I don't know. I mean, you really have no idea who's good and who isn't. The whole world is two and two. What I keep thinking about, Tom, is Tom Brady did something that I think happens to us. Is He sort of made a, you know, prognostication. For us, it would be a report, but for him, it was sort of a summation of there's all this bad football. And he makes it. And then there was a terrible football game on Thursday night, and it's sort of like, oh, this proves Brady's point. It happens to us sometimes in reverse. You'll say, like, oh, this quarterback is in trouble of getting benched, and then, you know, in trouble and could get benched, and then he goes out and throws for 400 yards, and you're like, wow, I'm an idiot. I look stupid. Brady did not look stupid. He actually looked very smart. Um, but it was also because he said it, I think it's going to cause more people to be like, oh, wait, there is parity, but it's because most teams aren't good rather than most teams being good. And I think it's because nobody plays anyone in the preseason and just pick it for injury protection. Yeah, but honestly, that too. knows. Yeah. The nobody playing in the preseason is definitely part of this. I think there's a couple other things going on. We talk so much about all these new faces and new places through the offseason. Of course, Russell Wilson, one of the chief examples, Matt Ryan on the other side, neither of those uh, quarterbacks, those offenses looked in sync. They both are really struggling on the offensive line. The Broncos had a huge loss with Garrett Bowles, their left tackle now, uh, out for the season. But it, it takes time when you have, whatever. what do we have, 10 new head coaches this year? So you've got new schemes all yeah. over the place, then you add in That's new true. players. Yeah. That's part of it. And an interesting uh, theory that I heard from an offensive coordinator a week or so ago was because – you know, the NFL tends to be cyclical, right? It's a series of adjustments and then counter adjustments. For years now, there's been this shift offensively to, you know, the spread concepts and the RPOs and the college elements coming into the game. Well, now what you're seeing, according to this coordinator, was defenses are doing a lot more. They're throwing more scheme. They're bringing guys from more places because it's hard to react because the numbers game gets changed when you're running those run pass options and whatnot. So now defenses are countering and taking the basically taking it to the offense in terms of trying to dictate how the game goes. So does that mean that we're coming into an area here where defenses are going to be better? I don't know how many people watched that game last night and said, boy, this is some really good defense. No, you look at it and you say, how no, can neither of no these way. offenses function? But these parts all fit together, right, Ian? I mean, I, again, I, it's sort of oversimplification, but yeah, it's not always just about what one team is doing. It's also about what the other team is doing to them. Yeah, and I was, you know, was watching Jason McCourty on GMFB today and, you know, really does a great job and had a great opportunity to praise his buddy, Stephon Gilmore, for making that, you know, game-winning play. And he's in the middle of talking about Gilmore making this play, and he goes, but is it good defense? Because the offenses were so bad. And I was like, that's actually awesome that you did that because instead of just taking a gratuitous hug for your friend, you kept it real and are like, how good is it actually when the offenses just suck? But that's kind of what we're going through is like, are they, is the defense is great? Are the offense just bad? Like, it's all going to shake out at the end of the year. I think it'll be normal. But, like, there's been some rough stuff that we've watched. It's still fun. I still love it. But there's been some rough football. Well, you can tell the difference between like, who do you, who a good do you defensive feel? game and a bad offensive game. 
And to me, that was a bad offensive game because you're seeing – it's not like defenders, uh, pass rushers were beating offensive linemen with good technique. They were running by them because they weren't picking things up correctly. They weren't getting off the at the snap at the right point. Um, I think it was Kirk Herbstreit on the broadcast who had mentioned at one point that the offensive linemen told them they're still trying to learn – Russell's cadence so if they're not getting off at the right point especially in a home game when you're expected to you expect the defense to be a, a, a affected more than you or, or, or rather you're affected uh, more as an opposing offense that's a problem and that's going to lead to all this kind of disjointed uh, offensive line play that we're seeing and the other thing with Russell Wilson is you know I, I don't know maybe he took for granted the chemistry that he had with his receivers in Seattle that he developed over many years, including Tyler Lockett. I mean, he would be able to drop the ball into a bucket to Tyler Lockett 50 yards down the field. And now he's having trouble connecting with Jerry Judy 15 yards down the field. These guys have got a lot of work to do. Perfect timing as we just showed the B-roll of him missing Jerry Judy. Uh, these guys have a lot of work to do. <laughs> and Russ has got work to do because you've seen the breakdown by now of how that fourth down play – I, honestly, like, I'm not pretending to be an NFL quarterback, but watching live after watching so much football, you get a sense for where the ball should go. And as I saw K.J. Hamler make that break on the right and they ran that pick play, I'm thinking, okay, there he is. That, that's where the ball should go. And, and Russ is not even looking there. And, and you've had former NFL players and former quarterbacks break it down for you saying that was the design for the play against man coverage, and he didn't even look that way. So Russ has got some work to do. He got a 10-day layoff. You just lost Garrett Bowles, one of your offensive linemen. You lost Javante Williams last week. You're starting to get really shorthanded on the offensive side of the ball. They got a lot of work to do to, to, to clean it up. Well, let's talk more about the Broncos on the other side of the breaks. They're one of those teams with a new head coach in Nathaniel Hackett, one of five first-time, first-year head coaches. Let's, let's run through all those guys from Mike McDaniel to Kevin O'Connell to Brian Dable to Matt all of them, there's 10 of them. a forward progress report after this. You get it? There's 10 total coaches. Forward progress. I get timers, it. Man. For, do you, are you listening? I don't get it. Are you, you even listening? Progress? Turn off the baseball. I am and I'm watching the game. The Insiders. I'm watching the game. Back after this. Nathaniel Hackett and the Broncos have been in the spotlight for a variety of reasons through the early portion of this season. He's just one of the five first-time, Ian, first-time first-year head coaches uh, around the NFL. So let's, let's run through all these guys to this point, something we're calling the forward progress report. Uh, in terms of Hackett, and I think that this is, you know, clearly you go back to week one, there's an unusual situation at the end of the game where they opt to kick a very long field goal instead of going for it on fourth down, it becomes a thing. I, I truly believe if that game had kicked off at 1 o'clock mountain time, like a lot of Broncos games in years past have, this does not become nearly the thing that it has since. There's one name of a game management guy in the entire league that we know, and it's because of the fallout from that. And then the fact that the Broncos happen to be in primetime seemingly every single week, you are watching what I would say is a first-time head coach and a new quarterback going through puberty. You are seeing the awkward phase right now That's where nothing looks right, nothing is firing on all cylinders. Russell Wilson is not playing like peak Russell Wilson. You go back to the game last night against the Colts, there are a lot of plays where Nathaniel Hackett and his offensive staff have a guy running open, and Russell Wilson is not hitting them. It's difficult to separate the quarterback from the head coach, particularly when the head coach also doubles as the offensive play caller here. I just, Ian, I, I struggle to get on board with the very, very intense criticism of Nathaniel Hackett, who's had all of five games to be a head coach, three of them on national TV. The quarterback is not playing well, and we're still at a fairly early juncture in the season where, by the way, they have won two of those games and easily could have won a couple of yeah. them. I know you do. You struggle with this, which is fine, because none of us know what we're looking at right now. It's like five games into the season, and the whole thing has been a mess. I would, And you and I, I, th I think, Tom, are in a similar place where we've known Nathaniel Hackett. I'll speak for myself. I've known Nathaniel Hackett for a very long time. 
I have a lot of respect for him. As a guy, he's actually awesome. One of my favorite people to just sit and talk football with. Like, you get lost in the, like, football nostalgia and history if you talk to him just in a random, you know, non-game setting. Like, he's great. Uh, it's been really tough. And it's, you know, I, I think there's a lot of blame for Russ. Um, and I think, you know, what Mike was talking about last segment, the final play, you know, if you get press coverage, you run that play, it has to go to the slot. It has to. I mean, that's the only read. And I talked to an offensive coordinator who ran, runs the play all the time, and he was like, the fact that Russ didn't look there first and only is alarming and problematic. So that's bad. But then it's like, is that coaching? And I think there's a lot of things last night where you could say Nathaniel Hackett is reaching in a way that no coach should ever reach and chase, right? Like going for the end zone when you can easily just – kick a field goal, going for the end zone when you can easily just try to gain six inches and get another four downs. Like, there's things that it looks like he's trying too hard. And is that growing pains, or does that mean it's too big for him? I hope it is not too big for him. But all the stuff you're talking about, Tom, about the intense pressure, it's only going to get worse. It's already past the point, I think, of everyone calm down, he's learning. So I don't know how they get out of it is my main concern, Mike. The quarterback's supposed to help with the transition, right? Like, that's why you trade for this guy. He's a ready-made uh, individual who's supposed to come in and almost be a coach in the field. And, you know, we're, we're now to the point where I, I think when Tom Brady left Foxborough, we were like, oh, it was, you know, Bill and Tom together that made that happen for 20 years. You know, maybe it was more Tom than I thought. And the, and the, and the point is that coaching is really important in this league. I'm starting to think quarterback play might be more important. I, I see, I, I, It's kind of crazy to say that because oh, the well, coach has got to deal with the whole way. operation. But especially when you've got a first-year head coach stepping in who hasn't been a coordinator before or a, call, a, a play caller before, and now he's got to worry about game situations and all this stuff uh, on top of all the, uh, everything else he's got to worry about, Okay. Your quarterback should be holding his hand and guiding him through that. That's why you spend all that money. That's why you parted with all those draft picks. Okay? And he's not doing it. And Nathaniel Hackett, after the game, there was some frustration when he said, the fourth down call, yeah, we made a call. It's a play that Russ likes, and it just didn't work out. Oof. He yada yada yeah. the most important part, which is that it didn't work out because Russell Wilson made sure it didn't work out by not reading it correctly. This is a problem for the Broncos right now. I don't know what happened to Russ. I don't know why all of a sudden he's just nowhere near. Like, it, it's okay to have some struggles and to not have that chemistry with your receivers that I'm talking about. But the little things that he's not doing, head scratching right now. And really briefly, too, before we move on to these other coaches here, I, I would also say one thing that drives me nuts. This is not a defense of Nathaniel Hackett, but it's just a – I think something that always sticks with me is week one and you kick the long field goal, which again, outside the box decision doesn't work out. I, I certainly understand the criticism of it, but what did everyone say? You paid $240 million for the quarterback, put the ball in his hands. So last night he does that on fourth and one and they throw and Russ maybe makes the wrong read. Definitely doesn't complete the pass. It doesn't work. What does everyone say? Why didn't he just run the ball? Take it out of his hands. Kick the field goal. Anything else. The outcome-based analysis all that. on this stuff drives Forget me absolutely that. crazy. It, it, it's, like, it's like when you run, a, when you run a, 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 an end-around pass and it goes incomplete and everybody goes, that's so stupid. But if the guy completes it, it's like, wow, what a gutsy call. Forget all that. It's just Russ is, Russ is on the hook for last night. All right, let's talk about a coach who, at least in terms of the win column, has done a little bit better here early on. Ian, your evaluation, the forward progress of Dolphins coach Mike McDaniel. I was talking to a uh, high-ranking Dolphins source in February last year, right? Uh, no, January last year. And talking about Mike McDaniel, when he was just kind of like a, you know, a blip on the radar, someone who might get interviewed. And the, there was so much intrigue into this guy who seems and looks nothing like any other coach. He just looks like a regular bro uh, who is not a screamer and yeller, is not a motivator, just a really good, smart football guy who is really more like a regular person than like a not a regular person. And I kept thinking, like, can this actually work? There's just not a lot of 
examples of this type of guy who's worked. And it's been great. Like, and it's not just that he draws up great plays, although I think he really does. And you guys know, like, this has always been kind of the guy behind Kyle Shanahan for years and years and years. Um, he seems to be leading in a way that's unlike anyone else leads. So he doesn't yell. He's cool. He explains to his players what to expect and what's going to happen, and then takes them through it when it does, and then works with their psyche as it's happening. And you just don't get that a lot. So he's been great. The team's been awesome. Um, and the whole thing's a really cool story. Did that answer the question? I don't know if it does or not. That was good. Mike, Brian Dable, what do you think? I remember talking to Joe Judge uh, when he was head coach of the Giants at one point. They had just won a game. Um, and I remember him saying, he was telling the players, you need to understand the difference between why you won this game and why you lost the week before, making the crucial plays at the right time. And that's something that... Judge was trying to instill in these guys for various reasons. It just never happened. Again, I'm not knocking Joe Judge. I still think that there is a future head coach deep down inside Joe Judge if he's in the right situation. That was a horrible yeah. situation. But the point I'm trying to make is right now it is working for Brian Dable. And right now he's getting his guys to understand the difference between winning and losing, not hurting themselves at crucial moments. In fact, helping themselves at crucial moments. So I'm looking at this Giants team. I still think they're maybe 8-9, and nine, right? They're on the wrong side of 500, maybe even 7-10. and 10. I don't think they're a playoff team. But I think it's because they're not talented enough and it's because they don't have the guys that they want and need right now. General Manager Joe Shane still building his foundation, and it might take a year or maybe even two more before they're finally at a point where they feel like they've got the right guys at the right positions to be successful. But the point is, if you're laying the groundwork for the guys that are going to be here for the long haul to understand why you're winning games and you're getting them to buy into that, now all of a sudden, when the talent comes in as well, you add to that that winning mentality and the ability to do things at the right moment. It's a great combination, and that's why, I hate to compare it to the Bills, but that's why these guys came from. That's why the Bills have been as successful as they've been the last couple of years. I understand the 13-second thing. I get all that, but the Bills are fantastic. The Giants want to get there. This is a great starting point for Brian Dable. I think he's doing a terrific job so far. It reminds me a little of the 2017 Bills, which was Sean McDermott's first season. They had no business being a good team that year, and they knew they were going to have to clean house on the salary cap, which they eventually did in 2018, but they got into the playoffs. They played an ugly playoff game against the, Jacks against the Jaguars, nearly pulled it out in Jacksonville. Tyrod Taylor was the quarterback. And then what happened? 2018, that's when they had to bite the bullet and they took on tens of millions of dollars in dead cap space. They got the cap right. Obviously, got the quarterback in Josh Allen. And then they got rolling. But maybe this is a team that finds a way to overachieve. Mike does exactly what you're talking about. Uh, the Vikings with Kevin O'Connell, we've talked a lot about him through the course of the offseason. Inevitably, when you bring in somebody who's a polar opposite type of personality, as O'Connell is from Mike Zimmer, it does have this kind of placebo effect, the breath of, breath of fresh air coming in. When you watch the Vikings play, they played really well offensively in week one against the Packers. Since then, it's been kind of rocky. And it's some of the issues that we've seen in the past in terms of when they just don't have a rhythm to them and you end up with some three and outs and it doesn't seem like you can create off schedule uh, with Kirk Cousins. But it's something that Kirk told me about prior to week one, which was just you got to remember, this is a very different system. Even though it's kind of derivatives of the same offense, it, it's a whole lot of different stuff. And so you're trying to find that rhythm. And you saw it last week in London against the Saints where Justin Jefferson's hopping up and down in the end zone like, why isn't the ball coming to me on this play? That's some of the stuff that you've got to grow through. But they're a really talented team. They've got some older parts on defense. The defense is a work in progress, too with a new scheme, but in terms of like how Kevin O'Connell seems to have brought that building together, uh, that part of it so far certainly seems like it's been a success. And last one, Ian, real quick, Matt Eberflus in Chicago, the Ford Progress Report, please. Uh, Matt Eberflus's defense are tough and tough-minded and kind of grimy and are really awful to play against. I mean, that was the way it was in Indy for years and years. And this Bears team looks exactly like that. I mean, they really do. They look exactly like that. I don't know how talented they are on offense. I think they got some talent deficiencies. And, you know, I think it's pretty fair to say Justin Fields has had probably a little more growing pains than certainly he imagined. So there's been plenty of times when it has looked ugly. But somehow they're 2-2. Two and two, And I don't know where they're going to be. They, they think, when I was at camp there, they thought they were going to be a lot better than people anticipated. 
and I'm sure people rolled their eyes on that when I said it, but they really did. And they've been better than everyone anticipated. And I don't know if they can keep this up winning this way, but, like, this is what Flus's defenses were like, so I don't know. I mean, at least the team looks like him, which I think is a pretty good place to be as a head coach. A lot of injuries going into the Week 5 games here as well. A couple quarterback situations, one with those Giants as they head over to London to face the Packers. Also the Patriots, once again, trotting out Mac Jones. He's at least moving a little bit right now. Let's tackle all those injuries. And also play Ask the Insiders coming up next right here on The Inside. A few injuries to update heading into week five. We'll start with Giants quarterback Daniel Jones. Full participant in practice as he comes off of that ankle sprain. He's good to go Sunday in London against the Packers. Patriots quarterback Mac Jones officially doubtful against the Lions. That puts rookie Bailey Zappi in line for his first NFL start. And also Miles Garrett, the Browns superstar defensive end, off the injury report. He will play against the Chargers on Sunday after missing last week's game following that one-car accident that led, left him with several injuries. All right, guys, sometimes on the show we like to play a little game called Ask the Insiders. You at home can participate. Just use the hashtag Ask the Insiders and ask us your question through various social medias, preferably Twitter, because that's the one that we all tend to check. Let's head back right now to Landro's Barber, Landro's Barber Shop, Landro's Barber Palace. It's got a specific name. Back to Landro's for another question here. What's up, y'all? Roy from Los Angeles. Why do everybody hate on the Cowboys? But watch this every week. Roy the Barber from Landro's Barber Lounge. I knew there was a specific name. Ian, why does everybody hate on the Cowboys all the time? God, I really appreciate you screwing up the name. Only literally one name that you had to get and you screwed it up. Um, it says why shop on the script, on the but I knew it wasn't right. I knew I didn't have it. Go on. Yeah, you didn't have it. Um, why does everyone hate on the Cowboys? Great question. A couple reasons. One, uh, because they're everywhere. And when a team is everywhere, half the people love it and half the people get tired of it. Two, their fans go to all the games, so you literally can't get away from Cowboys ever. If you watch any of our shows, half our shows are basically Cowboys. And the fact that they're good now means we're going to talk about them more. And when they're bad, we talk about them even more. So... It's not like everybody hates them. You just hear about them a lot. So half the people hate them because they take up so much of our brain space. That said, I don't hate the Cowboys. I, li I like the Cowboys. A <laughs> couple of things. Uh, it was easy I to hate somebody who was a Cowboys fan uh, when I was growing up because the team was really good, right? So, oh, I'm a Cowboys fan. Of course you're a Cowboys fan, right? Like, they're in the middle of a dynasty right now. It's like oh, yeah, a yeah. couple of friends who were Chicago Bulls fans. Duh. I mean, come on. How about some adversity? Growing up in, in Philly, by the way, where we didn't have championships and success and all this stuff. It's like we're here suffering and you're just cherry picking the teams that are the best teams there. That's number one. Uh, number two, uh, more to the point of why do people still watch him every week? It's because the same reason that yeah, pro wrestling has heels, right? Like you have to have the heel to have the face be successful as far as a rooting interest, right? You can't have everybody be a face. I'm, I'm pulling out pro wrestling terms on you right now. But that's why, that's why it works. And that's why it'll continue to be something that drives fandom and the hatred of said fandom going forward. And I love it. Speaking of the Cowboys, Dak Prescott officially out once again with his thumb issue. So it'll be Cooper Rush trying to improve to 4-0 this week against the Rams in L.A., Next week, as we've been reporting, is really the first game. Realistically, Dak has a chance to get back. That one is going to be against the Eagles. So we absolutely won't be talking about the Cowboys every single day on this show, right. as well as on NFL Network, from now Agreed. until infinity. Uh, real quick before we go here, Ian, the question I'm sure everyone is wondering, do you have your own name on the back of that jersey? Uh, I got no name on the back. Can you see that? Because when I was growing up, okay, uh, the Mets had a lot of bad players and traded them and cut some, so you couldn't get one name. So, no name. Not even a number. Support the whole team. Sad, sad, sad. <laughs> sad. 
Thank you very much for watching. You can catch us right there. Those times on the screen. That's when we're streaming on every Pat Fast platform. It's Tubi, it's Pluto. They're all free on your TV. You can also see us on the NFL app. Every episode is posted to the NFL's YouTube page as well. You can't miss us. Please keep coming back. For Ian Rappaport and Mike Garofolo, I'm Tom Pellicero. See ya. Let's go Mets.